Hi class 10. So this is the second half of industries. In the first half of industries we discussed about agro-based industries where the industries raw materials are based on agricultural inputs like how fibers are made out of it like silk and jute and also agricultural inputs like groceries or fruits and vegetables and crops any kind of industry which is based on that so we mainly focused on three industries which was sugar industry cotton industry and silk industry there are other agro based industries also but we mainly focused on them today we'll be looking about mineral based industry we'll be looking about four major iron and steel industries we'll also be looking about electronic industries and how it has grown in our country and also about petrochemical industries so you know that the syllabus the first eight has not been completed yet and in this portion you know the waste management and transport is already completed and the first half of industries is also completed today we'll be looking into mineral based industries iron and steel petrochemical and electronics and inside iron and steel we'll be learning about four major steel plants tata iron and steel company belai rootkela and vizac Okay, iron and steel, iron and steel, iron and steel. We are hearing that pretty much a lot of times. But is both the same? No, both are in the same. There's a huge difference between iron and steel. We are taking out iron when we are converting it into steel. We are not using it as iron. Why are we converting it into steel? Why are we not keeping it as iron? The picture on the left indicates iron. The picture on the right indicates steel bars. So you can see the difference. One is glossy. One is more lighter. One is more harder and dark. Is it just the appearance which is different or is there much more that's different to it? We use steel every single day. So you and me use steel at home in the kitchen for our daily utensils. Most of us have stainless steel scales, uh, scales for you in using your exams or everyday usage. And if you think for a second, you can understand that every single one of us use steel every single day and yet we don't know how it has been manufactured. Okay, consider it as the backbone of a country because it helps in the machinery of all other industries. So when we are discussing about the classification, remember me telling primary industries, iron and steel, primary industries, iron and steel. So this is considered as the primary industry or the backbone or the most important industry because every other industry needs iron and steel for their machines, for their functioning and for their work. So if this industry is not there, no other industry will work properly. Our nation is rich in iron reserves and has many integrated steel plants. So we have integrated steel plants and we, we also have other places which are not integrated steel plants, which are mini steel plants. So there's a difference between both. Integrated steel plants is where you take out iron, raw material is iron, iron ore like hematite or magnetite or lemonite, some kinds of iron ore where iron and all other materials fe2 o3 fe3 o4 all these are iron mixed with other unwanted materials and you remove the unwanted material take the iron from the rock okay and then you convert it into steel that is what an integrated steel plant does handling raw material like iron ore then you convert it into steel you make steel you roll steel you shape steel and you do all the other stuff from iron but what do mini steel plants do they also make steel but where do they make it from? How do they make it from? They make from e-waste or electronic waste steel scraps. For example, your smartphone, your mobile phone, your tablet, your uh, personal computer, your laptop or your any other electronic gadget which has steel already in it. And you're throwing it out. It gets broken, it gets recycled, it gets ripped off and it's broken into smaller pieces. And there's a lot of unwanted steel that is dumped. You take that steel, you melt it and you increase its hardness by adding manganese or limestone or some other hardening agent and you recycle that and make it into new steel from old steel scraps that is a mini steel plant so know the difference integrated steel plant is from iron ore transforming it totally into steel plant but mini steel plants is you take waste steel scraps from electronic waste and then you convert it into new steel so why are we converting it into steel why can't we use it as iron there are many many uses for steel which doesn't apply for iron number one more durable which means it can stay for a long period of time it doesn't break or it doesn't uh, it stays for a long period of time for example the life of an iron bar is much more lesser than the life of a steel bar steel is much more stronger and it is more durable 
less resistant to rusting the most important point or the most important reason why steel was started to make or be made was because of iron being susceptible to rust we know that oxidation a kind of weathering we learned in the last year is formed on iron iron has a tendency to form fe2o3 or feo2 when it comes in contact with oxygen when fe comes in contact with oxygen it combines and forms feo2 or fe2o3 or any other form of iron oxide which is rust and rust obviously makes the iron brittle and it breaks down and it is not good we don't want to have a product which is made up of iron if it is going to rust and break down right so we want to make, have something which is made out of iron which is strong enough but doesn't rust so since it is less resistant to rusting and it is it doesn't get a chance to be influenced by oxygen steel was made so this is the most important point steel doesn't rust but iron rusts steel is more durable iron is less durable and the most another important point is steel is easily shaped you can change its shape you can see the railings or scale or bars or there are many many things rods made out of steel because it can easily be bent it can easily be made to sheets your uh, car and bike which you or automobiles which we use the outer covering or the outer framework is made out of steel because it can be shaped into any form or any desired structure so these are three major advantages and why three major reasons why we converted iron to steel okay so we use all these utensils this is just cookware but we also use much more for automobiles for your daily stationeries and for tables and chairs steel is everywhere we use it everywhere there is railings where we use steel for holding and walking near the stairs so want to know how this steel is made just continue to watch this is the process we will be detailedly learning about the process but this is the picture of where iron ore and coal are the two major inputs you take iron ore for example magnetite is an iron ore where there is a lot of iron and there is some unwanted material you remove the unwanted material and take the iron from the rock and it is mixed with coke coke is when coal is heated at a very high temperature it converts into a form of carbon which can give energy for a long period of time if coal can give energy for 1 hour coke can give energy for 3 hours so coke is heated coal which is converted into something which is called coke and that can give you energy for a longer period of time so coke limestone and this iron ore is put into a blast furnace and along with it some manganese is also put and that is how steel is made so this picture is just a rough understanding and you can see the four three major types slabs are made from slabs you can make rings or coils and plates then billet is made from billet you can make hot roll bars and rods or tube rounds then blooms are made in structural shapes and rails or the railings on which trains move that is also made so these are the major ones which are used for you can see ships cars violin and instrument and this railings also many 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 uses for all the kinds of these are all the kinds of uses usages for steel here is the video of how steel is made you can just take a look at it steel and iron is an essential part of our everyday life it makes up the buildings where we work the appliances that we use and the cars that we drive without it modern day life would look a lot different Last year, the world steel industry produced 1,864 million tons of steel, the equivalent of over 5,100 Empire State Buildings. So, how does this essential aspect of daily life transform from some rocks in the ground into one of the strongest structural materials in the world? Let's take a look. The steel making process starts with the processing of raw iron ore. The rocks that are mined containing raw iron ore are ground and near elemental iron is extracted using magnetic rollers. This fine iron ore is then processed into clumps that can be put inside of a blast furnace. At the same time, coal is cleaned of impurities in a furnace. This results in an almost elemental form of carbon called coke. This coke is then mixed with the iron ore clumps and heated together in a blast furnace. This process produces molten iron or pig iron from which steel is made. Different manufacturers often add additives to the molten steel like chromium, nickel, titanium, and a variety of others to produce desired traits. 
Adding these elements create different alloys of the steel. At this point, the molten iron, sometimes referred to as molten steel, passes through continuous casters and is formed into its final shape to cool. Steel production is essential to the modern world, but its overall process isn't really that difficult to understand. In fact, it's so easy to understand that Okay, so that gave a, gave a rough understanding of how steel is made. So we'll be learning into detail. There are four main sections of an integrated iron and steel plant. Number one, mixing of raw materials. You have iron ore, you have coke, you have limestone, which is mixed at the ratio of four is to two is to one, which means four parts of iron ore, two parts of coke, and one part of limestone. Then number two, there you put it in a blast furnace, which is a high steel structure lined with bricks, like how a brick kiln is made. And the ore is changed into iron, at high temperatures when you put all these three at this ratio and the final molten liquidy product you get is called pig iron then you have the third part which is steel melting the impurities of the pig iron pig iron still has impurities like coke and limestone you have put it into it and even though you have extracted iron or iron from iron ore, there's some impurities still in it the impurities are removed from the pig iron by oxidizing them example silica impurity when exposed with oxygen will become sio2 so imagine there's some si and there's some potassium, there's some manganese, there's some nickel, there's some uh, there's some limestone. All these will react with oxygen. So you expose them to oxygen. If there's some silica, it will become silica SiO2 and it will be removed. If there's some sodium, it can become NaO2 and it can be removed. So all extra impurities can be removed by oxidizing them. Then you add manganese and nickel or chromium with the help of desired steel quality. If you add manganese, you get mild steel. If you add chromium, you get stainless steel. If you add nickel, you get another variety of steel. There are so many varieties of steel, but the most abundantly made is when manganese is added and mild steel is made. That is the steel which is used for automobiles, for trains and for railings and for most commonly large scale industries, manganese is added to make mild steel. Then the last phase is rolling mills. It is cast into a molten steel. It is shaped, it is rolled, it is made into sheets or any other shape which we want. So you can see two sets of pictures here. On the left, you can see steel. On the right, you can also see steel, but one is more glossy in appearance than the other one. The left one, you can see pictures like clamps, welding stuff. And also the last picture on the left, you can see that is how the bottom uh, walking board of a railway coach looks like so inside a railway coach if you walk there will be some portions which is made out of steel which looks like this so all these are on the left are mild steel on the right you have shining steel which is also called stainless steel you will have stainless steel glasses stainless steel vessels at home stainless steel scales for you your stationaries so what is the difference between the two mild steel is a type of steel which has less amount of carbon along with iron stainless steel is a type of steel which is made up of chromium and iron so here there is less chromium, here there is more chromium. Here there is less carbon, here there is not much carbon, but there is more chromium. Iron and carbon are major constituents. Other elements include manganese and silicon in mild steel. Iron and chromium are the major constituents. Other elements like nickel, molybdenum, titanium and copper also are less in amount. Same point they are telling about the composition. Here iron and chromium, there iron and carbon. Non-resistant to corrosion, resistant to corrosion. So, mild steel, even though it is much more better than iron in, when it is not corroding, but still when you compare it with stainless steel, it can corrode a little bit. But stainless steel is, compared to even mild steel, it is much better. It completely doesn't corrode or rust. May contain 98% of iron and 2% of the remaining metals. But stainless steel composed of 90%, remaining 10% is composed of chromium and other metals. Weldability is high, which means you can change it to any shape and you can weld it and that is why it is called ductile. But stainless steel, because you add chromium and you have that glossy shine, you cannot weld it. Weldability is low and it, hence it is not much ductile or cannot be changed into shapes much or as common or as easily as mild steel. So these are the two major differences. Okay, we have four major iron and steel plants in our country. One by one. Tata Steel Limited in Jamshedpur. Number two, Belai Steel Plant in Chhattisgarh. Number three, Roorkela Steel Plant in Odisha. And number four, Vishakapatnam Steel Plant in Andhra Pradesh. We'll be learning about all the four now.
Another important point is that when you look at this map, you can see that most of the steel plants, iron and steel plants are on the eastern side of India, not on the western side. This might be a board question which is asked, why is most of the iron and steel plants located mostly in the eastern side? Or there can be a question, is the iron and steel plant located in the east, western, eastern, northern and southern? More. You will have to write eastern. They will ask why, give reason. The reason is coal, manganese and iron ore. Limestone is present in western side also or northern side also but coal, manganese and iron ore all these three raw materials which is very very important for the production of steel is only found in abundance in the eastern side. There are a lot of mines in the eastern states like West Bengal, Jharkhand, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Odisha and most of the iron and steel mines are there because raw materials like coal, manganese and iron ore are formed there. So please remember this point it's very very important. So what are the factors that help an industry? We just discussed about this in the previous class also. So we'll just go through it once again. Raw material, you need the raw material as well. Iron ore or coal, you need the raw material. Then you need abundant energy, whether you take it from hydroelectric plant or solar or windmill, you still need abundant energy. You need to be near a water source or a river for constant inflow of water for cleaning and for other manufacturing processes. You need laborers, cheap laborers who are willing to work for a long period of time and you need more number of laborers. With 5 or 10 people, you cannot run a factory. You need more number of laborers. Number 5, you need good transportation where if you want to export to other countries, you need good ship and ports nearby. And also you need trains or roadway services within the nearby limits so that you can transport materials to other states also. And the last one is market, what people are willing to buy. Are you producing products which people are willing to buy? If you're not producing products which people are willing to buy, then there's no use in continuing to produce goods in your industry. So doing things according to what the people require and what the mandate or what the people are desiring for large scale and small scale is market and that is the most important point when you consider the factors that affect industry. Okay, number one, Tata Steel Limited in Jamshedpur. So while we are discussing about all the industries, the previous slide we told the six points, raw materials, laborers, energy, water, market, transportation. Remember these six points clearly. We will be discussing only about the six points in all the industries. So don't worry about thinking oh, I have to learn about all the four industries. The six points which I told, learn about those six points related to those four industries. Nothing else. Tata and Steel Limited, what are those six points related to Tata Steel Industries? Rurkela Industry, what are those six points related to that industry? Only that. You don't have to worry about anything else. Okay, so this is earlier called Tata and Steel Company or Tisco, an industry which had many factors, as many factors that made it successful. What are the factors that made it successful? Iron, coal, manganese, limestone are easily available nearby, so there's no cost or no transport. Energy source and water. Damodar Valley project is where they get the hydroelectricity and energy from. Jamshedpur, which is in Jharkhand, is then the confluence. You know, confluence is the merging point or joining point of two rivers. Kharkai and Subarnareka rivers are the two rivers and they meet together at a point and that point is Jamshedpur. So it's a confluence of two rivers and they have abundant water. Cheap labor. Jamshedpur is in Jharkhand, so nearby states like Bihar and West Bengal have so much population. These are densely populated places and then they have so much labor also. Transport, they are close to the main rail lines of Kolkata port and the main eastern railway track also falls through Jamshedpur, so it is also helpful. Moving to the second one, the Lai Steel Plant. Lies on the main road between Mumbai and Kolkata. At that point is about transportation. Energy from Koba Thermal Plant and water from Chandula River. So you have energy and water resource included in that point. Limestone from Kauri is less than 25 km from Bilai and Chhattisgarh. So limestone is nearby, so that's the point about raw materials. Coal from Korba Mines, Jharia and Ranigan's coal fields. So coal from these three places, which is also a point which tells about raw materials. This is the main plant for sale. Sale is a short form of Steel Authority of India. So Steel Authority of India has given the license to some steel plants and one main important steel plant which comes under this government Steel Authority of India is Bilai Steel Plant. This might be a question asked in your boards. Which steel plant among the four steel plants falls under the Steel Authority of India? You should remember it is Bilai Steel Plant of Chhattisgarh. This produces rail lines and heavy steel plates is also an important point. The market, what people want. 
people want steel uh, rail lines and heavy steel plates people want doesn't mean individual people like you and me people want also means what the government needs for the country needs for the state needs that is also market and rail lines and heavy steel plates is what the demand which comes out of Bella steel plant then you have brewed kela steel plant which started in 1959 with the collaboration of two people of a german family which is group and damak of germany located in odisha at the confluence this also at the confluence of two rivers sanka and brahmani rivers obtains iron ore from nearby districts of bon bonaigar and kionja coal from korba coal fields limestone from birmithpur water from mandira dam energy from hirakud water project power project road killer lies on the main railway system connecting mumbai and kolkata so these are the points that i've i've tried my best to reduce the points for each steel plant so that only raw materials and river oh sorry and water energy and transport are the our laborers are the main points which come in laborers are recruited from bihar jharkhand and odisha because these are also places which have high densely populated regions Next, coming to Vishakhapatnam steel plant started in 1971. This is the only seashore-based steel plant in India, extends to about 33,000 acres. Imagine the size of 33,000 acres. It's such a big, huge steel plant, and it is the only seashore-based steel plant in India, which means Vishakhapatnam is a port. It's a coastal place in Andhra Pradesh, and it produces steel. Sorry for the spelling mistake. It produces steel that meets global standards. Among the four steel plants. the steel which meets the global standards and it can be exported to eastern southeastern asian countries like malaysia indonesia and also china china is a country which demands high good quality products so if we are able to produce steel that meets global standards and sell to these countries it means that we are producing really good products at vishakhapatnam steel plant so that's about transport and export operates coal from bayladilla in chatisgarh limestone and manganese from andhra pradesh since vishakhapatnam is support transport transportation and export is easy in vishakhapatnam steel plant but still like cotton and silk sugar there are problems in the iron steel industry as well resettling natives where new plant is constructed so imagine you are imagine the size of the vishakhapatnam steel plant 33000 acres so much people would have been living there you have to shift them to another place that is a real difficult need So here's a picture of people moving from one place to another. Similar situations might occur if you have to start a new steel plant or a huge factory. You have to resettle the native people because it causes a lot of pollution in the air and water. People need to move away. That's a huge burden. Needs huge capital and takes a long time to grow. Industries like steel industry, like a sugar industry or a cotton industry or a textile industry, will not grow immediately. The amount of money you have to put in and the amount of money you can make from it and once it becomes a success it will take 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or even 50 years till it completely grows and it will take more time because of a country like us we are still developing so the time needed for an iron steel industry to grow is so long so that is a problem and it needs so much money as capital or initial investment old steel plants have outdated machinery old machines and needs to be updated which is a common factor coal coking coal which is coal heated at a high temperature which produces coke that reserve or coking coal reserves are very few in india and hence we need to import that coking coal from other countries and that is also an expense inadequate power supply and power cuts at homes we are struggling imagine what would be the situation if power cuts are common for big industries which need to produce and need energy for a long period of time that affects small steel plants and it has to be shut down if there's constant power cuts moving to the second half electronics industry in the past few years electronics industry has grown and developed more than any other industry because of the demand and usage you are watching this in a laptop or a mobile phone or a smartphone that comes under electronics industry so you can understand how much electronic industry has developed over the years india has an abundant availability of skilled and technically qualified workforce that helps in the growth of industry if you look at the majority of people in our country the youth or the people who work in many places most of them are working in it companies or related to electronic industry majority of the india's youth are working related to electronic industry which 
means that India has an abundant av availability of skilled people, young people and technically qualified people which helps in the growth of this industry along with a lot of demand from youngsters to buy these products which so both of these things is helping in the development of the electronics industry. This industry is largely concentrated in southern India. So iron and steel is largely concentrated in the eastern part of India. Electronics industry is largely concentrated in the southern India. Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, Kochi, Pune all have a lot of IT and electronic cities and electronic sub, uh, hubs which is helping in starting up a lot of startups and electronic companies. These are some major electronic companies. You have iron, sorry, you have Indian Telephone Industry, ITI. Then you have Hindustan Machine Tools, which is HMT, which is a product which is made by HMT. Then you have Bharat Electronics Limited. This is a swiping credit card or debit card machine, which you would have seen, which is produced by Bharat Electronic Limited. Then you have Electron Corporation of India, ECIL, which makes, uh, which makes all the small components of a circuit and also small components which help machines to work like motors or semiconductors all these things are made by electronic corporation of india then you have central electronics limited which make electric surveillance security surveillance like the cameras we have in have we have in our classrooms or in police stations or microwave electronics or piezo electronic ceramics where when, when with the help of pressure if electrical signals is sent that is piezo electric electronic electric ceramics so there are different kind of electronic things that uh, many people in our country and many companies produce. So these are a list of some important companies which produce electronics or gadgets or devices. There are five major electronic sectors in our country. Number one, consumer electronics. What we use, you and me use. TVs, DVD plays, laptops, printers, paper shredders, all these are consumer electronics what a consumer use individually. Then you have communication and broadcasting, microwave receivers, satellite signals, terminals, optic fiber equipment, radios and radio communication equipment. Then we have computers. This is also something which consumers use like workstation, monitor, keyboard, mouse, external hard disk, laptop, supercomputers, personal computers, all these are related to computers. Even pen drive, all those are related to computers. Then you have softwares, producing softwares and inbuilt within computers with new technology of advancement in all fields. Softwares is not producing a device but it is producing softwares for example you have AutoCAD you have ArcGIS these are new new softwares this Microsoft Excel or Microsoft PowerPoint through which I am explaining this that is a software right so these softwares are also devised or designed by a person sitting in front of a computer these softwares are also done by people sitting in front of the computer for example games which you play in your Android mobiles those are also a kind of software which somebody sat and worked and developed on so those are not hardware things, but those are software things which are present inbuilt computers or inbuilt a device for new technological advancement in not just gaming or not just education, but in all fields. In all fields, softwares are helping. That is also a sector of electronic goods. Last is space technology where rockets, launch vehicles, satellites, GPS devices, remote sensing machines, all these are used. Last we come to the petrochemical industry. So petrochemical industry from the term we can understand it is from petro or petroleum. Industries that deal with organic chemicals derived from petroleum products like coal and LPG. The most common petrochemical product is what we use every day. Every day. We are trying to reduce it but it's still increasing day by day that is plastics. So plastics are petrochemical products which are formed or a chemical derivative of petroleum product. So manufacture of fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides, resins, carbon black, printable inks and synthetic rubber. You can see pictures like synthetic fiber on the top left. You can see plastics on the top right. You can see synthetic colors which are made. There are, nowadays there are millions of colors. The number of cloth. If you go to the clothing industry or if you even check clothes online, you can see so many colors which were not even there 10 years ago. How come these new colors came? These are synthetic colors which are created using uh, inorganic compounds and chemicals or petrochemicals you can synthetic rubber which are used for tires like the picture you can see in the middle right are also made from petrochemicals most of these industries are situated near oil refineries to reduce the burden of obtaining raw materials like naphtha ethylene and benzene these are the major raw materials which are taken from petrochemical industries from petroleum refineries of where crude oil and natural gas is taken so if the petrochemical industry is nearby it is very easy 
for the raw materials to take in you don't have to transport it for a long distance so you can easily manufacture it synthetic paints different colored paints or different chemicals on the bottom right also are examples of petrochemicals here the video of a petrochemical industry has become very common and this video of plastics in majority there are many other petrochemical products but how plastics individually has taken a huge change in how and it has revolutionized how we live how come plastic has become very common just take a look plastics have become such an entrenched part of our lives but what exactly is plastic and how is it made Before plastic became so ubiquitous, it underwent a transformation from being a strictly natural product to being synthetically and widely produced. Some of the earliest uses of plastic date as far back as 3,500 years ago, when the Olmecs of Mexico used naturally occurring plastics, sap from gum trees, to create rubber balls. During the mid 19th and 20th centuries, synthetic plastics like celluloid and bakelite made their debut and were used for decades. On the molecular level, plastics are made of polymers, which are long, flexible chains of chemical compounds. This structure allows plastics to be easily molded and shaped, especially under heat and pressure. Unlike the rubber used by the Olmecs, most of today's plastics are man-made and derived from fossil fuels. Crude oil and natural gas are primary sources as they provide a cheap alternative to plastic made from plants. The first step in the production of plastic is the extraction of crude oil and natural gas from the ground. From there, the fossil fuels are sent to refineries where they are converted into several products including the building blocks of plastic, ethane from crude oil and propane from natural gas. Ethane and propane are then sent to a cracker plant to be cracked or broken down into smaller molecules. Ethane produces ethylene and propane becomes propylene. Next, a catalyst is mixed in, which links the molecules together and forms polymers called resins. This structure allows plastics to be easily molded and shaped, especially under heat and pressure. Polymerization converts ethylene into the resin polyethylene and propylene into polypropylene. These resins are then melted, cooled down, and chopped up into pre-production plastic pellets known as nurdles. Nurdles are later transported to manufacturers who use heat to mold the nurdles into different types of plastic products. Many of those products actually feature information about their manufacturing process. Numbers called resin identification codes are often featured indicating which chemicals were used to make the plastic. Because of plastics utility, its global production has doubled about every decade. The amount of plastics produced since 1950 has measured at about 9.2 billion tons. The weight of nearly 1,600 great pyramids of Giza. Much of this plastic ends up as trash. Single-use plastics such as straws, grocery bags, and packaging products are particularly detrimental. They often aren't recycled and constitute about 40% of all plastic waste. They end up damaging natural habitats, endangering wildlife, and polluting communities around the world. Moving forward, a great way we can counter this plastic pollution is to reduce the amount of single-use plastics we use. By opting instead for reusable alternatives in our day-to-day -day lives, each person can make a huge impact in helping decrease plastic waste. For plastics that are already produced, other solutions are being explored. Scientists have discovered that a few organisms are capable of breaking down plastic material. Wax worms and mealworms, for example, can devour plastics and turn them into compost. Another plastic-consuming organism is a microbe, which shrinks the time plastic takes to degrade from hundreds of years to only a few days. 
Change is happening in the production of plastics as well, with some manufacturers turning back to plants for ingredients. Called biodegradable bioplastics, these materials are as durable as synthetic plastics, come from renewable resources, and can therefore biodegrade. Even the rubber tree, the same plant used by the Olmex, is once again being sourced for plastic. Today, the tree's latex is used to create a range of products, such as all-natural latex rubber gloves, tires, and mattresses. The rubber tree itself is now part of a global initiative for the natural and sustainable sourcing of plastic. That video gave us an understanding of how plastics from nowhere started to take over the world and now we are struggling in a point where we need to go back to natural alternatives. Let's see how petrochemicals have replaced our daily normal products that we use. Number one, synthetic footwear has replaced leather footwear. You can see the footwear on the left which is synthetic and the, on the right which is leather. You can see, you yourself know which footwear is very common now among the two. PVC pipes are replacing steel pipes. Which one is common among the two, you know. Plastic containers are replacing steel containers. Polythene bags replacing cloth and jute bags. Nylon and rayon fibers are replacing jute, silk and cotton. So when you look at this picture, you can see that all the pictures on the left are mostly dominating today's environment and society than the pictures on the left. But right, but it is to an extent in our hands. If we continue to work towards using more stainless steel than plastic containers, if we use more natural products like jute bags, than plastic bags and you should be prefer jute and silk and cotton clothes than nylon and rayon clothes and we prefer steel pipes in our homes rather than PVC pipes then definitely even though the right, high, right, right, side, right hand side is a little more costlier we are doing something good for the environment so petrochemicals are replaced the society only because we chose not because petrochemicals chose we chose to replace them through petrochemicals and why did we choose petrochemicals? Did it come suddenly come into place? There's a reason why we chose petrochemicals to replace the things which we used to use. What is the reason? This gradual change happened. Okay, these are the reasons. The gradual change of petrochemical taking over the normal products we used happened because petrochemical products are cheaper than the normal products which we used to have. Petrochemical products are more durable and more long-lasting than the products we used to have. Petrochemical products does not depend on agricultural raw materials. Very important point. Jute, cotton, silk or leather. Some way it is related to the animal industry or it is related to the agricultural industry. Agricultural based or animal based. Sometimes the raw materials might not inflow, come in or go out. But petrochemicals are not at all related to them. So you can easily produce how much ever we want, whenever we want. We don't have to wait for some raw material to come in. That's another important reason. Petrochemical industries can mostly be constructed anywhere without considering a climate factor. All the other industries, a jute industry, a cotton industry, a silk industry, we have to look at the climate, we have to look at the soil. Because those are the places where we can grow those things and we can get it closer to our industry without causing a lot of transportation. But petrochemical industry you can construct without thinking about climate and soil, which is a very big advantage. Petrochemical products are lightweight, need less labor. When you look at into another industry of, for example, a steel industry, it is much more heavier product and needs more labor. But petrochemical industry, a PVC pipe or a PVC uh, or any other plastic product, it is much more lighter. If you compare any plastic product, a plastic chair is much more lighter than a, than a metal chair. A plastic table is much more lighter than a metal table. A plastic door is much more lighter than a wooden door. Every product is light and we need lighter products. So that's why we shift it. No factor other than the inflow of raw material will affect the quantity of production. Another important point. Even if there is less labor, production will be the same. Even if more labor, production will be the same. If there is transportation, production will be the same. If there is less transportation, production will be the same. Climate, if it's raining, there will be still production. If it's not raining, there will be still production. Because it is not going to affect the raw material of plastic 
raw materials is the only thing that can change the quantity of production no other point among those six seven points which we discussed energy or water energy also can change to a point because energy is needed for the production but no other major factor will affect the production like other industries get affected so this is a very important slide please take a look at it and please write down all these points what is the reason petrochemical industries took over the normal products petrochemical products replaced normal products what is the reason these are the reasons so that this is the last slide major petrochemical industries you can just learn the names of two or three industries heredilia chemicals in chennai produce phenol acetone and alcohol derivatives on the top left you can see phenol indian petrochemicals corporation produce but which is in vadodara produce polymers polyester fibers synthetic organic chemicals you can see polyester fibers on the top right haldia petrochemicals in haldia produce benzene butadiene and polyolefins which are also different chemical compounds petrophils cooperative limited in gujarat produce polyester filament yarn and nylon chips the bottom left picture of something which looks like sugar crystals that is called nylon chips it is used for the production of fibers like you can see gold yellow and blue fibers on the right those kind of fibers are produced with help of nylon chips so nylon chips are melted at a particular temperature and then they are pulled with the help of strands so that in that way they produce this thin thread like structures so nylon chips are used to produce yarn or thin polyester fibers and the last one bonai gawan petrochemical corporation in assam which produce polyester fibers like the one on the top on the bottom right like the yellow gold and the blue ones these are about petrochemical electronic and financial industries i hope you were able to understand and get a clear picture about all the three industries and we'll see you soon